Hello, everybody. Uh, just wanted to spend a little bit of time here walking through the second phase of your unit, which is going to be the analysis of uh, the short story Cathedral by Raymond Carver. And so I started off here at our uh, landing page. If you go on Blackboard, this is what you see when you click under Unit 3. And as I said in the last video, everything that you need to be successful in this unit is in this PowerPoint. Um, I wanted to avoid having you go to a whole bunch of different platforms. Hopefully you can just navigate through this PowerPoint and, uh, and be able to be successful in the unit. So right now, if you have read the story of an hour, and if you have watched this story of, analysis, uh, of an hour analysis that I've posted, uh, if you've read or listened to Cathedral by Raymond Carver, which is right here, if you've done all those things, then you're in the right spot right now. If you haven't read or listened to Cathedral, you wanna take some time and do that before um, before you watch this segment because it's just not going to make a whole lot of sense otherwise. Once I'm finished with this, probably by the time you see it, I'm going to post that under watch class video so you can kind of come back and take a look at this. And what I want to do is just go back into that conversation around semiotics, around signifier and signified that we had before uh, the move online and apply that to some of the things that we're seeing in Raymond Carver's short story. Now, one of the things that you'll you'll notice about his short story is that it seems as though it has this really straightforward message, right? That his protagonist is kind of this misanthrope. Uh, we don't really particularly like him. Uh, he seems misogynistic and biased and uh, bigoted and, and racist and, and all these terrible things. And then by the end of it, he has this epiphany. What I want to encourage you to do is to think about this text as more than just a simple story about somebody who was bad and became good. It's not just about that redemption. What I want to look at is how is it that we can look at how Raymond Carver infuses this story with meaning through the first person account of that misanthrope character um, who doesn't have a name. So I'm going to navigate to that text right now, and I'm going to point out three or four different sections and maybe give some perspective on how you could look at those sections with an eye towards uh, literary analysis and lit theory that we're going to look at later this week. So I'm just going to bring up the uh, document here. Okay. So as I said before, you've already gone through most of this. And we see that uh, even though we end up knowing the blind man's name, we end up knowing his name is Robert, from the very beginning, our protagonist refers to him as this blind man. Not the blind man, not Robert the blind man, not uh, Robert who's blind, right? Um, this blind man. And it's, it seems disparaging. And he admits right out of the gate that... Most of his ideas about blindness came from the movies. In the movies, the blind moved slowly and never laughed. Sometimes they were led by seeing eye dogs. A blind man in my house was not something I looked forward to. So we see that perspective come out right in your first paragraph as we are kind of getting to know the tenor of the conversation. So he goes through and starts talking about his uh, wife's interactions with the blind man, about his discomfort with the way that Robert um, ran his fingers over her face and neck. But if we scroll down here, on the second page, we really get a sense for the kind of person that Robert is, or excuse me, that, uh, that the narrator is. And so he's talking about, he's talking about uh, his wife's ex-husband, who we can feel a little bit of jealousy. As a matter of fact, we feel a lot of jealousy throughout this text. Um, on the part of the narrator. But it says here, my wife's, 
my wife's officer was posted to one base and then another. She sent tapes from Moody Air Force Base, McGuire, McConnell, finally Travis near San Francisco, where one night she got to feeling lonely and cut off from people she kept losing in that moving around life. She got to feeling she couldn't go at it another step. She went in, she swallowed all the pills and capsules in the medicine chest and washed them down with a bottle of gin. Then she got in the hot bath and passed out. But instead of dying, she got sick. She threw up. Her officer, why should she have it? Why should he have a name? He was a childhood sweetheart. What more does he want? Came home from somewhere, found her, called the ambulance, and in time she put all that on a tape and sent that tape to the blind man. Over the years, she put all kinds of stuff in the tapes and sent the tapes off lickety split. Next to writing a poem every year, I think it was her chief means of recreation. So when we see this, what should be alarming to us is that this conversation that uh, the narrator is having, or this account that the narrator is giving, should really be about his concern for his wife. But instead, what this all becomes about is <clears throat> his jealousy towards the uh, ex-husband and his jealousy and his uh, discomfort with the fact that she put all of this information into a tape and sent it to Robert. And then down here, next to writing a poem every year, I think it was her chief means of recreation. And so we see this kind of uh, attitude is looking down, looking down on uh, her writing a poem, looking down on her relationship with this person that he just can't understand. And if we want to understand where his confusion comes from, it might be helpful to start thinking about what his background looks like. And so we see here that he's described as not having any friends. We see here that he's talking about uh, the blind man's wife's race because of her name. Um, Beulah in Hebrew means betrothed. Beulah, as a matter of fact, was also the name of the first African-American female to star in a sitcom of the same name in the 40s and 50s. This is a TV reference. And so we start seeing all of these little indicators, right, that he doesn't have any friends. He doesn't have any blind friends, but he doesn't have any friends in general. Right? that he has these very limited outlooks about what the world is like that he bases off of television. We heard earlier that um, he had gotten all of his in, uh, uh, ideas about who blind people were and what they were like from the movies. If you scroll down, we, hit, we see this line right here. And it talks about how... Uh, the narrator thinks that the blind man thinks that Robert's marriage was pathetic. And so he says here, I found myself thinking what a pitiful life this woman must have led. This is Beulah, the blind man's former uh, or wife that had passed. Imagine a woman who could never see herself as she was seen in the eyes of her loved one. A woman who could go on day after day and never receive the smallest compliment from her beloved. A woman whose husband could never read the expression on her face, be it misery or something better. Someone who could wear makeup or not, what difference did it make? She could, if she wanted, wear a green eye shadow around one eye, a straight pin in her nostril, yellow slacks, purple shoes, doesn't matter. And then slip off into death, the blind man's hand on her hand, his blind eye streaming tears I'm imagining now. Her last thought might be this, that he never even knew what she looked like. and she on an express to the grave. Robert was left with a small insurance policy, half a page, 20 peso Mexican coin. The other half of the coin went into the box with her. Pathetic. So this sentiment, you know, which if you really think about it is, is this beautiful gesture, right? It was obviously something that they had together and, and uh, that they had done, this relationship that they had. The only thing that our narrator can see is the fact that they never were able to have a visual relationship in the same way 
that he has with his wife. And we see the value that he puts on that later in the, uh, in the text. What we really are seeing is we're seeing this character who relies and gets his, his perspective on the world almost entirely from visuals. That he can't conceive of a place, can't conceive of a, a reality where existence isn't firmly planted in the physical, in the visual world. But we know that to see something isn't the same as understanding something. And this is really contextualized well as we uh, begin to get into the metaphor of the cathedral. So if we, I'm going to scroll all the way down here to where that begins. We didn't say anything for a time. He was leaning forward with his head turned towards me, his right ear aimed in the direction of the set. Very disconcerting. Now and then his eyelids drooped and then snapped open again. This is this is the narrator just staring at the blind man and watching, staring at Robert and watching him watch TV. And then he describes what's on the screen. On the screen, a group of men wearing cowls was being set upon by, uh, tormented by men dressed in skeleton costumes and men dressed as devils. The men dressed as devils wore devil masks, horns, long tails. This pageant was a part of the procession. The Englishman who was narrating the thing said that it took place in Spain once a year. I tried to explain to the blind man what was happening. Skeletons, he said. I know about skeletons, he said, and he nodded. The TV showed this one cathedral, and there was a long, slow look at another, and finally the picture switched to the famous one in Paris, with its flying buttresses and its spires reaching up to the clouds. Notice they're not saying that it's Chartres Cathedral. He doesn't say that it's Chartres. He says it's that famous cathedral in Paris. Now, it's not necessary that he understands, you know, cathedrals in Paris. But the question that he asks down here really makes all the difference. He says, something occurred, this is uh, the narrator speaking, something occurred to me. Do you have any idea what a cathedral is? What they look like that is? This, to me, I think is one of the most significant lines in the text. That the narrator says, do you know what a cathedral is? I mean what it looks like. Therefore, what he equates meaning with is visual. And what Robert gradually reveals to him is that he can't. Even though he sees a cathedral and knows what it looks like and wants to understand it, he has no capacity to, to explain what a cathedral means, what that actually is, in a religious sense, in a sociological sense, that he, his understanding is only surface deep. And so one of the things that begins to emerge is that this becomes a commentary on how it is that the narrator creates and understands reality and what the difference is between a really strong visual understanding of something and an actual deep uh, complete understanding of that same thing when we're looking at this from a literary analysis standpoint when we're looking at this towards lit theory we want to think all right so who is it that the narrator is representing and what is it that robert the blind man represents what is it that the cathedral could represent? And then you could go through and, and think about this. So how is it that this could be read in a socioeconomic light? What does this tell us about uh, the class system? What does this tell us about the nature of the classes and how the classes interact with one another? How might this uh, be a commentary on uh, maybe feminist theory, right? And the way that he treats his wife and the way that he views the um, blind man's relationship with his wife, with, with Beulah. How could we see this as a extension of Marxist theory or of um, psychoanalytic theory? So what is it that's psychologically broken? Could we put the narrator on uh, the psychologist's couch and see what's psychologically damaged about that character and why that matters to us from a cultural standpoint? Could you look at the autobi or the biography of Raymond Carver? One of the things that's interesting about Raymond Carver is that he frequently um, deals with the working class. And so all of these things might be ways that you could think about this text and look at it differently.
I'm going to run out of time in about two minutes here.